You're listening to Tech Nest, the Prop Tech Podcast. In each episode, you'll hear from Prop Tech founders, investors, and industry veterans on how they're using tech to change the way we buy, sell, and invest in real estate. Discover market opportunities, interesting data, growth tactics, and trends driving the industry forward. This isn't just another podcast about making money in real estate. This is about how we live. And now your host, Nate Smoyer. Okay, let's imagine e-commerce, but for rental listings. It's kind of what we're talking about today. I've got Austin Lowe. He is the founder and CEO of Peak. He got his start in real estate actually working at an investment fund. They were creating data-driven models, investing in e-commerce and internet platforms. And, you know, he he had this interest in real estate and he went so far as to become a licensed real estate agent in New York City. He learned the rentals game in New York City. And, you know, as I've been told, because I've not done it myself in the city, that can be a grueling way to cut your teeth. And they've created this company He started back in 2019 called Peak. Now, Peak is a complete solution for property owners and managers. They're delivering a self-serve leasing experience, uh, enabling renters to shop and tour properties 24-7 online. Imagine you can check out an apartment just like e-commerce. And that's the vision that Austin has here. We talk about that. We talk about a new product launch coming up uh, from Peak. And then uh, we even got into a little bit on artificial intelligence. And before you think that we're going to talk about chat GBT and using listing descriptions, because right now I'm just going to throw a whole bunch of shade at just saying listings descriptions as the application for AI and real estate. Austin had a really interesting take on this uh, based on the data that they're collecting at peak and how that could be a very unique input for AI models moving forward whether they're using it or other use cases uh, that are represented in the market. So uh, you're going to want to hear his take on that. Go ahead, hit play. Let's jump right in. Hey, Austin, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Nate. I'm so excited that you brought up that you are also a distance runner. Uh, I guess you've been seeing my, my Sunday weekly tweets on how many miles I've run these days. I've been seeing your your weekly tweets and and that running log on your quest to 1500 miles uh, in a year. There it is. 1500 miles this year is is the goal and 150,000 feet of elevation gain. Um, rather arbitrary numbers, but significant improvements over last year. Uh, and I've got a big race in June, but you're doing you've got a your your third New York City marathon coming up this year. I, I do. Um, when is I'm... it? I don't I actually forget when the marathon is. It is always uh, daylight savings. So, so they screw with you. They, they, they make you they make you like get on a bus or a ferry at like five in the morning and then throw on top of that. Oh, yeah. By the way, like all the clocks are changing today. Um, <laughs> so it's usually like the first week of November. Uh, but okay. it'll be um, it'll be my fourth marathon. Um, yeah. And, uh, yeah. Yeah excited to run it um it's i mean I, I live in new york city so it's it's kind of like a, a hometown victory lap some somewhat of a fun fact and this is a this is a debut information tidbit on the podcast i've never shared i have been to the new york city marathon and i've been at the finish line uh but i was not a runner uh i was actually hired as an mc uh because i used to mc stunt shows and we were uh doing a bmx demo right at the finish line entertaining people while people were still out running oh my so, God. <laughs> so at least you weren't the guy so at, at the finish line they have a guy who will just like read out like all the running clubs all the jerseys and say oh yeah and yeah now we have a finisher from the seychelles and yeah he, yeah he does that for like four hours yeah like, it's a hey you gotta stamina. like <laughs> Gotta like being on the mic. Well, you know, there's probably some um, crossover reasons as to why people in prop tech would also put themselves through running for hours on end. 
I haven't really figured out how those wires got crossed, but they are there. But I want to talk, uh, we're going to talk about the company that you've been building. And so uh, with tradition here, please go ahead, uh, let everyone know who you are and what you do. Sure. Uh, my name is Austin Lowe. I'm founder and CEO of Peak. Uh, we are a software solution uh, that aims to create a better way uh, to find a place to live. Boom. Love it. Succinct, right to it. Now, um, there's a lot of a lot of solutions that are helping people find a place, helping people sort through. Uh, give me some. Uh, let, let's jump right into the details here. What is Peak doing differently than all the other solutions that exist on the market today? So, this really ties into my background. Like pr- prior to this, I was a portfolio manager at a fund focusing on e-commerce companies. Like e-commerce has been kind of the focus of my professional career. And Peak was started with this question of how do we make it as easy to rent an apartment as it Mm. is to buy a pair of shoes on the internet? And at the end of the day, like you can take the existing process and try and create mechanical replications of it, automate it as much as you want um but at the end of the day you're kind of just you're creating a mechanical horse there there's that um apocryphal like henry ford quote i believe um i don't even know if it's actually henry ford but it's attributed to him um mm-hmm, saying mm-hmm. if you were to ask a stable master in the year 1900 how we how you would go faster than a horse he would say oh you build a mechanical horse um but obviously we know that what came about and how we go faster than a horse is a car it's something that doesn't look like the incumbent solution and and disruption really like rarely takes the form of incumbent solutions so for us like we started off by and really like in the early days deconstructed the problem um i actually got my real estate license i actually um worked uh rentals uh for a number of months in new york city Uh, not a fun job not something i would recommend anybody do grueling marketplace (laughs) to cut your teeth yes uh walking up a lot of like unair conditioned stairwells and like business casual ish uh, that's when you became an ultra distance runner was doing that job <laughs> the, Did, the start didn't even the, know you were uh, training masochistic streak <laughs> right but um uh, when we really decompose the process and when we when you look at it through an e-commerce lens like mm-hmm. people are willing to transact digitally when there's trust Mm-hmm. When I know that what I see online is what I'm going to get, what you see is what you get, creates mm-hmm. that magic. And in some goods, it's as simple as showing a picture or writing a description. Um, mm-hmm. In others, it's reviews. Um, think about something like mattresses. Um, Casper was a, a one of the last companies I did work in as a public markets investor and i was always amazed i was like people are willing to buy a mattress online they're going to sleep on this thing for four to six years yep and the quality of a mattress is like this if you've ever um if if you ever just stayed in a hotel with a bad mattress you'll like that that's immediately apparent um Mm -hmm. but even with all that we didn't have e-commerce for finding a place to live at least for a rental um for for a purchase you can say there's a whole host of other things in which it's really hard to convey the quality of call it the homes foundation or deed restrictions or financing tied to that but a rental is a relatively kind of uniform transaction and the way we believe that you can build trust the way you can drive an e-commerce like experience is to start with an interactive 3D experience. If you're selling mm-hmm. space, you you want the customer to be able to experience the space digitally. And that's really where we started in saying, you can't just virtualize the model unit. You can't just virtualize the amenities. Like that's, that's lead generation. If you mm-hmm. want e-commerce, I have to show you unit 708 if that is the one that's available. Um, So our entire platform starts with being able to deliver 
unit level virtual touring. Um, not only the units, but all the amenities, some of the common areas of the buildings and use that to drive a much more efficient leasing journey. Hmm. All right. I, I think this is going to sound like a, a ridiculous question to ask, but I think it's important to this discussion. Let me set it up here. Uh, it was April probably when the pandemic hit, maybe June, I don't know, somewhere in that rain, right? When, when, when cities all shut down, 2020. And I'm sitting in my, uh, you know, we, we rented an apartment in the Gold Coast, Chicago. And I was like, well, I got to go buy something because the opportunity seems right. So I got to go buy something. And so uh, I also took his opportunity to try and get firsthand experience of like what was happening, you know, that in, in the real estate market. So I was on Redfin and I saw a book of virtual tour. I said, well, wow, they shipped that fast because <laughs> it was fast that they turned it on on their website. I was like, okay, cool. Let me go through this process. And I just, I, I like, I, I documented the whole process and like sent it to my team. It was like, we could do virtual tours. Look how easy this is. Because <laughs> all it was, was a button. And then after the button, you're like, do you want to do FaceTime, Google Meet, or Zoom? Okay. And I was like, okay, I guess I'll do FaceTime. That works, you know, whatever. Yeah. And, and so I did like that. I was like, okay, so that's, what they're calling a virtual tour. I mean, we're all familiar with Matterport. So that, that gets mentioned as a, and described as a virtual tour. I've also seen other alternatives pop up as a virtual tour. So the question here is, how do you define a virtual tour? I think the term can be applied very broadly and, and, and is one of these, uh, right before we started, we were talking about meaningless jargon. Um, yes. It has become so jargonized and been used to describe so many things um, that there are. And then you could say a FaceTime call is a virtual tour. Um, we lean into interactive 3D mm -hmm. virtual or interactive 3D experience. And the things that really define it um, is that Number one, interactive. Um, this is an asynchronous experience. It, it doesn't require somebody live on the other end. And what this does is that if you can have a virtual tour where it's just FaceTime and somebody mm -hmm. else is walking through the property, but that is limited. Your storefront is only open to the hours in which you have somebody there to walk throughout the property. Mm -hmm. In something that is interactive and asynchronous you have a 24 7 storefront a storefront that's open every single hour of the day every day of the week it doesn't matter whether or not you have people sitting there and that is one of the key accelerants um, mm -hmm. for e-commerce that's one of the things that drive this faster transaction cycle and then we actually see that in our case studies um, in terms of the days vacant um, we're able to reduce the days vacant of a unit anywhere from 20 to 45 percent. Wow. And a lot of this is driven by the fact that you're allowing people to view the product asynchronously 24 7 at any day, at any time. Uh, the second piece of it um, is 3D. Now, there are a lot of kind of a lot of people will call videos virtual tours. Um, and it is virtual, it is a tour, but when you think about the user experience, if you want to convey a sense of space, um, the roughly 105 degree field of view that you get from the back of an iPhone camera is vastly inferior to a 360 degree field of view that the user can actually control. Mm -hmm. Um, so having that 3D experience is very significant. And Matterport does that. Uh, Matterport does do both of these things. Um, however, Matterport takes a long time to create. And it's really structured as a horizontal tool that mm -hmm. it is a virtualization software that is used for real estate, construction, insurance, all sorts of different use cases. And 
it's the best way to put it is like it's it's like the Microsoft Excel um, of of virtualization products, and that you can use it for almost anything. But if you want to build anything on top of it, if you want to use it for a specific purpose, you have to do all the cutting and gluing on top of it yourself. Mm-hmm. I could mm-hmm. build a CRM in Excel. Um, we actually have call it a crude CRM for for a side thing um, built in Excel. Um, mm-hmm. It takes a lot of work. You have to manually cut and glue everything, um, but it's possible. But obviously, there's an entire class of products of CRMs that have it built for you, have it configured for you, have the integrations, have all the tooling ready for you such that it's a plug and play experience. And Mm -hmm. when we think about virtual touring, when we just think about the virtualization layer and and Peak is an entire stack that spans beyond that, um, that's really where the difference is. Like you can Mm -hmm. use a horizontal virtualization product that is designed for multiple uses that can be used for sales that can be used for insurance that can be used to digitize your basement uh, because you want to you want to put in new flooring um or you can use peak which is specifically designed to create a better rental experience got it and so it's not just though and see i think this one of the things here is it's not just the the tour piece there's exactly. okay taking it to the next step so peak solving that next step like okay i, I, have, I have the tour that's great now what and then i like most websites then you go to through a standard contact type experience walk me through what the peak experience is so the next kind of layer uh past the virtualization itself and in, in the peak product um are all of our integrations um existing real estate websites <laughs> generally uh aren't the most flexible things on earth. Um, mm-hmm. Generally, the the content management systems aren't built to handle flexible types of content or, or be able to light box um, external mm-hmm. hosted content. And even on top of that, even if it does support it, uh, you don't necessarily want to be dependent on your leasing professional to plug in the right URLs into, into the boxes in the CMS. So our no-code website integrations take care of all that. Um, we, we call it our magic button. It injects buttons that will launch the virtual tour light boxes uh, for the corresponding units um, if they're available. Mm-hmm. So instead of having to think about either replumbing the website and or constantly managing the content, um, if you think about like an e-commerce site, like if somebody, if red t-shirts go out of stock like they're you don't have a person on the back end saying oh my god i need to take red t-shirts off the site it just doesn't right um and that's what the peak website integration does um when the units not no longer available we pull the virtual tour down so that the website integration for unit level virtual content to deliver a unit level experience um becomes the set it and forget it experience for our partners now the the counter argument to that Austin here I'm going to I'm going to play the role uh, I'm a Chicago real estate agent I'm just trying to get my business off the ground right I've got I got this building that says hey here you can have our rentals right cuz they don't want to deal with them and I'm thinking like okay I know that apartment was just rented but if I leave it up I can collect 10 or 20 more leads and tell them, sorry, it just got filled for the next two to three weeks. Wouldn't, wouldn't that be to my advantage to leave old inventory up so I can collect leads off of it? So when we think about the agent model, which is actually somewhat idiosyncratic to large cities, um, agents have call it a motivation to, to collect this book of business. Um, Mm -hmm. A lot of actually like modern websites also do this in that they'll say, hey, unavailable, contact me when this is available. Yep. Um, and you can still do this in some way in, in, in leaving up the virtual tours for the model units. Say, hey, like this is the green floor plan um, and still allow people to tour it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but fundamentally, when it comes to facilitating an e-commerce experience, 
you want to provide that seamless journey. You want to build that trust. And part of building that trust is saying, yes, everything that you can see here is actually available. Yeah. I, I tend to agree. I mean, the getting started on like from a position of trust, I think goes a lot longer, longer way as a real estate agent for what it's worth. I asked that because I ran into that scenario while we were in Chicago, like multiple times. I'm like, or, or, well, yeah, that unit's just an example. I'm like, well then which, which unit am I looking at? Like, we're like, well, it'll be one that's sort of kind of like that one, but it might be updated. Not sure. And it's like, it's like, it was maddening and frustrating to like, don't make me have to come to the building to look at the place. I just, I just want to know if this is it or not. I mean, cause the amount of time of just shopping and looking and up and down elevators, it's just like, it, it's so exhausting. It almost feels that, that experience, like I equate to the same as like having to buy a car, you know, <laughs> and just like, you know, what you wanted isn't on the lot, but now you're, you're kind of stuck there and you've put so much time into test driving all these things. And now you're in the, and, and, then after you've finally negotiated the price and you agree upon that, now they put all these add-ons and, and pressures and you just keep saying yes and signing. You just keep signing and saying yes and you're way beyond your budget before you ever know it. It, it just, it's so wearing on the consumer. I, I want to see all that like just kind of go away. And we, we, we talked a little bit before the, the show started here and you kind of gave hint about what you've got coming up. You, you've got some new products coming from Peak. Uh, I think that we can, we can talk about a little bit here. So I don't want to, I don't want to say what they are, yeah. but it kind of goes the next step to like further reduce friction. Can you share more about what you guys are getting set to launch here? Or by the time this interview airs, we'll have launched and, and now what's available to the market. Sure. Um, and this actually ties really nicely into call it, um, not only the launch of the product, um, uh, but a, a new market, um, that we're, we're going to be able to to bring our products to. Um, so by the time this airs, uh, Peak Total Leasing uh, will have launched. And what Peak Total Leasing is, um, is an end-to-end -end digital platform that allows a prospective renter to virtually tour the exact units, um, the amenities, mm -hmm. the, the rest of the building, as they have been able to uh, since Peak's launch. Um, but be able to take that one step further. Be able to say, hey, I want to see this place in person. Schedule a time, verify their ID. We give them a pin code to a uh, to a small key locker and then let them tour the property. And mm -hmm. what this does is that it creates an end-to-end -end digital experience that also essentially drives, call it the marginal cost of showing a unit down to next to zero uh, because mm. you no longer need to have a person on site to facilitate this process. And not only is this really exciting when it comes to large enterprise property owners and managers um, who that's call it 90% of our, our customers today. Um, mm -hmm. But this is also really impactful for your small and medium property owners, the four to 50 unit buildings. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, simultaneously, uh, we are also launching our services uh, or launching our platform uh, to this kind of long tail of the market that is traditionally served by agents uh, mm -hmm. who are trying to collect leads, who are frankly more incentivized to kind of slow the process down and, um, and show you that they're doing something to justify the call it thousand or two thousand dollars that they're collecting from the property owners. Um, and instead for us, like we are able to provide essentially leasing as a service mm -hmm. to, um, to all these small and independent property owners as well. Um, so it's an exciting offering, uh, in that not only we're, uh, we're launching our new product, uh, which, the self-guided touring experience uh, was actually developed um, and or co-developed um, in conjunction with Grace Source centralization efforts. Um, so oh, we've, very cool. we've worked for more than six months uh, with their um, with with their teams uh, to develop the self-guiding the self-guided touring product to make sure that's robust, make sure that's flexible, make sure that it'll work across call it 
90, 95% of their portfolio. Um, but now like really the impact that we can make in terms of creating a better way to find home, which is our core mission goes mm -hmm. beyond just your call it 200 to 1000 unit communities. Yeah. And, and you, you mentioned a little bit earlier that you're you know, already integrating with a bunch of other tools. And one of the challenges it seems like, you know, for any point solution provider, especially in the large multifamily is that you have a handful of like incumbent platforms that it has to work with. Otherwise it can be really challenging to get that adoption. I'm curious if you've kind of faced that same like element of friction well, of like I, I would, you have I would to push work. You on this. I would push you on Do this. Do it. I mean, hey, we are, go for we are it. evolving out of a point solution. Oh, Peak total okay. leasing is a complete solution to handle that decision funnel. Mm -hmm. You can layer on top a CRM to optimize your communications. You can layer on top other tools, but it's not about virtual tours. It's not about self-guided tours. It's about a holistic solution that can essentially take a prospect and turn it into an application mm -hmm. as a software solution. Got it. So it's no longer just, hey, like we'll, we'll do one step of the process and it needs to tie tie everything together. And really like when, when you think about integration, it's like one of the most difficult things that our customers have told us is that when you integrate five different tools, all the, mm -hmm. all the reporting is a mess. Because none of it's mapped to work together. Everybody reports something in a slightly different way. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. What somebody will call a tour is a note in another system, which is an, a, a just an add-on to the guest card in another system. And it becomes a mess in terms of the reporting. But what Peak mm -hmm. Total Leasing also does is that it gives the ability to have one consistent data stream on the prospect's entire behavior throughout the journey. From the first second that they set on, eyes on the property, we're logging and we, we have what we call our prospect intelligence feature, um, which uh, actually also by, by the time this airs, uh, we're, we're launching a major update to that such that uh, the data is going to be streamed in real time, um, mm -hmm. where we measure exactly what prospects are looking at, what rooms they're spending their time in, what apartments they're looking at, um, and have that data stream all the, go all the way down to, okay, did they book a self-guided tour? Did they check in for the self-guided tour? What unit did they tour in person? And right. have all that consistently reported such that when it comes to integration, we have, call it one other system to integrate with. It typically is either a CRM or a property management system, um, but that's it. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I, I I appreciate that, and and uh, I don't mind the the pushback there. I wasn't uh, trying to in insinuate that a peak will be only a point solution, but the need for a full stack or full you know integration it seems like is a you know is almost like a non negotiable starter. Right, it it's got to do multiple things. Um, it sounds like you guys are now both available then still as a point solution, but going broader than that. And looking to become, hey, this can be this can be your solution. You can. Well, I think that's that's what the market demands. The, mm. the mar what the market is saying is that we can't have six different point solutions. Right. We we don't no. Want it's to it's deal frustrating. With all these different vendors. We don't want to deal with all these different integrations. And really, like, what it takes is is to look at the process holistically, to look at the problems that we're trying to solve. Mm hmm. And in this case, it's how, how do we create an easier process for somebody to become a resident at your property? Yeah. I want to talk through a little bit about security. It's got to come up in questions for you guys. And like, how do you know this is going to be safe and secure? My, my first question is like, okay, so how do you know who is touring your property? Can you walk me through just like functionally what that looks like? So number one, uh, when you book a self-guided tour, uh, we verify the IDs. Uh, we use 
third party ID verification solution, financial grade checks. We we can uh, layer on additional checks if if necessary. Mm-hmm. Um, but that takes care of most bad actors. Um, mm. If you're looking to monkey around in a property, um, there are you're a lot willing easier to ways show to show your it. ID to do it. Exactly. Like you're like. <laughs> you could do it without scanning your ID and and showing your selfie uh, because we actually do a liveliness check as well to make sure that you are actually the person oh, okay. in your ID. Um, so that weeds out most of the bad actors. Um, they're also called it the, the accidental issues uh, in which people always ask, oh, like what, like, what about the keys? What if the keys go missing? Um, oh, yeah. And... What we found is that fewer than half of a percent of tours result in keys missing. And you probably have more error amongst realtors with who who don't put the key back in the key box. (laughs) So that's the thing. Um, The instances of missing keys have predominantly been vendors, the painter, the cleaner, Mm -hmm. who who... have either forgotten or didn't have the keys or the owner told them to just book a self-guided tour who grabbed the keys. Right. And then because our, because the lock codes are only valid during the appointment time, weren't able to put them back. Oh boy. So it gives me a little bit of faith in humanity. I think so. I mean, it sounds, I, I know a lot of people who like kind of, this has been, this, this is something that's been talked about for some time now, you know, of different varying levels of like how you do a self-guided and how can you know it's safe and secure. And, you know, you, you, you said it right there. I mean, the data doesn't lie. It sounds like the majority of people are not just uh, willing, but also able to operate within the confines that are provided here. Uh, and in fact, those, the outliers to that are the ones who are probably the ones we, we didn't ask questions about like, would the realtor put the key back or would the vendor put the key back? You just assume yes. But, you know, I mean, stuff happens. And, you know, my short time as a real estate agent, um, I may have once or twice. I don't know. <laughs> well, you, you, <laughs> had, a, you had a to reason a to keep the keys. You had a reason to keep the keys. They weren't my keys, though. Back. It wasn't my listing. <laughs> So, but you know, I mean, stuff happens, of course. Uh, and but now I'm I'm curious here. You know, the, the I've been pressing everyone on this a little bit lately, and I think it's just because it's been so re- it's so relevant uh, to just about every conversation. I haven't heard you talk about artificial intelligence at all. Okay, you're talking about 3D tours, and and you've used I think I would describe it as like very consumer friendly terminology. Mm-hmm. You haven't gotten into like the deep of like what's behind the technology and that sort of thing. So I, first question here a bit is, um, are you guys using some level of artificial intelligence as like part of your product offering? And then the second level or, or, or bit to this question here is, what opportunities do you see most applicable to peak to leverage artificial intelligence moving forward? So artificial intelligence um, and, and this I'm, I'm, I'm stealing this straight from from my former boss. Um, is is going to be similar to the internet and electricity. In that, we don't think of every single company in existence today as an electricity company. You use it. Every pretty much every single company today uses right. electricity. Yep. And we don't think of them as oh, like they're an electricity company. And for a long time and, and even like even when I was an investor, people refer to them these some of these companies as internet companies. Just it wasn't that long ago. It wasn't that long ago, but there there was a whole kind of cluster of companies that they're like, oh, like this is an internet company. But Every company, to some degree, is an internet company now. Mm-hmm. That's where we're going with artificial intelligence. Interesting. It is one of those technologies that is so pervasively applicable and has such great implications 
that it is going to be woven into every single company in one way or another. And when you think about kind of the big thing that's changed in the last year is that prior to call it 2022, the call it tech consensus uh, was mm -hmm. that you had to build specific models. You had to build these big proprietary models. You had to train these big proprietary models um, in order to do specialized things. Like you can create artificially intelligent workflows um, or, or products, um, but you need to train it on very specific things. The shift, particularly as it pertains to language, image, and audio, has been that general purpose models have made this kind of quantum leap um, mm. where you, you see stuff like GPD-4 being able to pass AP exams um, mm -hmm. across, across multiple subjects, be able to pass the MCAT. Um, and that huge change results in a democratization of AI, enables every company to become an AI company. Because you can leverage these technologies now without having an entire machine learning AI team. You don't need to have three PhDs on your payroll in order to ship a product that leverages these technologies. Hmm. And when you think about kind of where this goes, like even, it, and, and, and I'm sure like you've played with chat GPT and, and some mm -hmm. maybe like mid journey or stable diffusion, mm -hmm. the prompts matter. Mm -hmm. The inputs are what matters. Yeah. And when we think about kind of where the future goes, if the intelligence layer is commoditized and available to everybody, and the inputs are what determine kind of the final outcome, companies with access to or who have the platforms where they're collecting or generating these inputs are going to be the ones that have hmm. enduring power. Um, Interesting. Yeah. And for us, like we view our virtual tour data as one of these very interesting inputs. Like oh, a byproduct of e-commerce e is that yeah. when you provide a workflow or a process such that people can call it, get very close to that buying decision or do, or do the buying decision itself. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The pattern of behavior in which they got there becomes predictive of whether or not they're going to buy. And you're able to measure all that behavior. Like in, in a brick and mortar world, like you don't have somebody following around every single shopper with a clipboard, just recording everything. Mm -hmm. um, but what we have now is a predictive data stream that not only has quantitative engagement data, but has visual image data as to what the product is. Um, and when we look forward to kind of unlocking the promise of artificial intelligence, um, I would say like these these are very interesting things to use as prompts. I appreciate that. And actually, I never even thought, I'll be honest, I've never even considered when when people use the terms inputs. And I'm not, I'm not an expert on, on AI at all. I did read a Packy McCormick uh, email on it recently, but... <laughs> I think I mean I think that's you just... could you could just like sit on Twitter for like two hours and like you'll get a crash course. I'm embarrassed to say that it's been longer than that, Austin. But <laughs> um <laughs> but I never you know, I didn't really consider inputs beyond, you know, like you're saying, like using data inputs from like people walking through a room or um, you know, which 
you know, which amenities that they tour most. And, you know, if you have a four unit, obviously this data isn't going to be super relevant. But if you're talking about professionally managing a significantly large portfolio of properties, now this becomes, it becomes really something more to go with. Um, I could also see it though, like, you know, the next step to this is like, what do you do with that, right? Of course, the, the immediate thing is like, oh, okay, we're gonna automate the sales agent and we're gonna like spin up a chat bot and it's gonna text them. It's gonna like give them all these updates. But in all seriousness though, it could do better property recommendations because it could genuinely scan not just what you have in your portfolio, but you could now your, how many MLSs are in New York City? Um, there, there actually isn't really one. <laughs> But that's what I mean. Like it's yeah. it's so fragmented, right? You could yeah. actually, you could take the data from a tour, you could take some of the the feedback, and you could do far better search and recommendation engine. And even if it wasn't circumventing the agent, you could be empowering the agent that much greater, you know, through some of this with some of the data that you're referring to. And I think that 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 to me is a very interesting application I'm, I'm so glad you didn't just say like we're just a auto generating listing descriptions because <laughs> <laughs> that's like, I'm like that's i mean that's one. good that's not bad it's not that's bad it's um, not bad it's okay but let's be real like that's i can do that already you know like we can already do that so um the mad libs could could do that really well for you anyway it's not really needing artificial <laughs> there, intelligence there used to, to be, some degree. There used to be like a Tumblr that was like broker battle where it just took like these, like the most like nonsensical, like Mad Lib style, like real estate descriptions. <laughs> um, we did, we, we had a listing generator and it's still in, um, it's still in use at Avail. It, oh, it really? works really well. It's been this way okay. for years. And it, it's one of those like features that it wasn't a driving feature to get you to use the product or sign up mm -hmm. and, and go through the flow. But we saw that when people used it, they loved it. Mm -hmm. And I used it and loved it. And I, I haven't list, had a list you know, for a few years. We've been really mm -hmm. fortunate with tenants uh, renewing. But it, it works so good. And it was on, it's honestly just like a programmed Mad Lib. That's it. Based on the listing description and the property details. And it just puts it to, and boom, it's, it's good to go. It's solid. Yeah. I mean, I, I think the, the other piece of this that we haven't necessarily kind of called out is that, like, although call it language models um, have gotten all the buzz, like, AI in itself um, is much broader than that. Sure, and, yeah. And AI as, as a whole is really, like, intelligence is, is centered around prediction. Um, and I don't know if you, you read Ben Thompson's uh, writings. Uh, every once in a while, he'll pop up in my Twitter feed, but he's like maybe oh, a little smart you, for you me. Gotta, you gotta subscribe. Um, I need to get like the I need I need someone else to like dumb it down and shorter versions, and then I can handle. Well, what you throw it in the chat GPT, and you say, "Hey, like, can you, can you <laughs> explain give this me... to me like I'm a fourth grader?" Yeah, it'll do it. That's not bad. That's, that's a good thought here. All right, I, I'm surprised somebody hasn't like hasn't created like like. Explain it like I'm five, like dot com, where you just put anything and then just GPTs out. That. It probably but, is out there. It exists. There's a thing for it for sure. But um, AI, I'm gonna... AI is about prediction. It's it's all about prediction. And, and when we think about large data sets and, and the essentially like the the explosion of progress in, in these models, like we're we're in for a very very interesting future. Like we've just scratched. Agreed. Those Speaking of futures and predictions, a year ago, I think a lot of people may have been, uh, would have said, yeah, we're headed for corrections. We're headed for some challenging times. I don't think people were envisioning where we're at today. At least I never read that articulation of it. Handful of things that, you know, prop tech founders especially have found themselves in a really unique position, right? Number of transactions has gone down. Lending is all kinds of screwy. Right, realtors are evaluating career options. We're seeing actual tick up of apartment vacancies and concessions happening. And all this is putting a little bit of strain on the VC community, whether or not they should keep investing into prop tech right now. Valuations are being, you know, readjusted. What are you seeing and feeling as a founder 
running a prop tech company, you know, obviously you guys are still early stage. So like you got to keep the lights on, you got to keep product development and somewhere along the way, I'm sort of assuming there's fundraising involved there. What are you, what are you getting as feedback as the appetite for continually investing into prop tech? So I would like to define prop tech first. Oh, hey, go for I, it. I I'd love this. At a high level, a lot of what, if you like go to VC's websites and you, and they have a, oh, this is a prop tech investment. They, they put a little tag on it or it's under a prop tech section. Mm-hmm. A lot of what was hot in the last 10 years, um, I would put under the category of financial engineer. Like, okay. it was not necessarily prop tech in that it was changing the way things are fundamentally done. It was using a fire hose of free money from the Fed mm. to be able to enable things like alternative transaction models, alternative financing, ownership, whatever models, uh, or zero cost lending. Um, which is what some some platforms essentially were. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, rates aren't zero anymore uh, or near zero. Anymore. Nope. Um, and those models break. And not only that, like on on the back of kind of zero interest rates, like that's that's an implicit subsidy on on the house purchase market. Um, and and driving transaction volume, um, not only in terms of number of deals, but the the asset prices themselves driving those mm-hmm. up. Yep. So businesses tied to, or businesses that explicitly received a benefit from low rates, are obviously structurally challenged. <laughs> like I think those are the ones that you're seeing layoffs hit. Um. But in terms of rising rates, for us, and I would just broadly say, like anybody in rental technology, Mm -hmm. this is a forcing function for change in that when the underlying financing on a building is suddenly more expensive, Mm -hmm. you have to look at how to operate more efficiently. And if you look at kind of the topics that at any of these big real estate conferences, it's all about operational efficiency, centralization, operational efficiency, like, um, and that presents opportunities and essentially shifts along the adoption curve of technology solutions that can actually provide a concrete ROI when it comes to operational efficiency. So for us, we, we've frankly found, found, found ourselves to be benefiting uh, from the rise in rates um, in terms of what our customers are saying. Mm-hmm. Um, in terms of investors, like rising rates and, and, and lowering valuations without going too far into call it uh, valuation math um, is an impact on their portfolios. Obviously Silicon Valley bank blowing up um, Mm -hmm. and and causing stress in the system Um, and deleveraging isn't a net good. Um, But at least from what we're seeing uh, and and we're actually involved in a couple investor conversations, um, as of time of recording, uh, hopefully they're done by uh, by the time this airs. Um, but what we're seeing is that there's still an appetite to invest because when you think about venture capital, like the timeline or the time horizon of these investments is measured in years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not just in the next, call it three months, six months. And frankly, like, it looks like it's trendy, and yeah, there's pressure to deploy, but you have to make decisions that you genuinely, like, is it going to pan out over the long term? Yep. Because you're not going to get the money back anytime soon. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, I, I think in, in the, call it, 
hype cycle or or or, or bubble um, of private capital, like you did have investors who were more focused on momentum um, and saying, okay, like I'll invest in this company, knowing that they'll have good revenue growth in the next nine months, and then they'll be able mm-hmm. to raise another mm-hmm. round, and then I'll be able to, um, yeah, yeah, and and play that game. But those are those are the firms that have gotten burned the worst, and and those are the firms that aren't writing checks right now because can't. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you sharing that insights. Uh, I think that, you know, for other founders who may be going through uh, trying to figure out how they're going to extend runway and, and fundraising, you know, there's a, there's a, we could go down a whole, we could do a whole show just on that alone. <laughs> but I, I prefer to stay on the positive ends and r- avoid the doom and glooms, if you will. Um, we're going to, we're going to transition here. Austin, no, we're going to jump into the bottom of the show. My favorite segments. The first one I like to call for the future. For the future is when I get to ask each guest who comes on the show to give their best predictions based on the following four questions. Austin, are you ready to play? Let's do it. All right, let's do it. Hey, all right. Number one, what does peak look like one year from now? One year from now. Um, I'm assuming you guys are going to keep the same logo. We have a lot of. interesting and potentially transformative things um that we are starting to do um with our data Mm. and our and artificial intelligence um in a number of forms um so our spread of products um, and what we are able to do and what we are able to address uh, will increase significantly. Very cool. Question number two, uh, and I'm focused a little bit more just on apartments here, about, but uh, how long will it be for more people to rent out a place, e-commerce style, if you will, than they do signing a physical paper lease in person? How long would it be until the e-commerce model does more volume than the uh, traditional model? Well, signing the paper lease in person, I think digital leasing um, is actually, that's a little further along than the search process. Um, I do think that you'll, you'll see the crossover in the next two to three years. Wow. Let's go. That's a lot of volume. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I I strongly believe that the the forcing function or, or the impetus for change is is here and and we're seeing it mm. and, and we are seeing it live. Yeah. Number three, what's one industry trend you think will continue, but you wish would go away? I I, I remember that you asked this, and I. I I remembered listening to to your show, um, and thinking, "Oh man, like I don't know how I'd answer that." Um, the first thing that came to my mind, I was like, "Austin, you should not say that." Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't like I will, to throw. I will say I don't like to throw say, bones here, but I'll I'll throw you a bone here. If you if, if if I understand, sometimes real estate's complicated, and you gotta you don't want to yeah. muddy waters with relationships. You can say it's perfect if you believe so. It it is it is definitely not perfect. Um, I actually think it. I actually do wish that it would go away, uh, and I'm guilty of this too. Uh, that everybody is suddenly using LinkedIn as their giant platform soapbox. Um, Let's all and, just uh, pay for the Twitter blue. Is that stop? Uh, <laughs> Twitter blue is cheap when you look at LinkedIn. <laughs> I, I don't think that helps either because Twi- Twitter like pushes you down in the spiral of, of, of other things. Um, uh, it could be, yeah. But yeah, like the the LinkedIn soapbox these days, like everybody, everybody thinks they have something to say, um, hmm. and it is like because of the format, 
and especially because of where the breakpoint is, and I've done a little bit of experimentation on it. Um, like any social media, um, it pays to just pave over nuance. Mm. And I don't know. I, I, that's not the way I like to look at the world. All right. All right, last one here on For the Future. What's one thing you believe will dramatically change or fade away in real estate as a result of tech advances? I think websites, websites, websites are going to change. Oh, okay. In that fundamentally search is going to become a lot smarter. Um, data sets are going to become a lot richer. And as we think about kind of the more hard tech side as cameras and LIDAR and like that and imagery technology continues to advance. Mm -hmm. um, my bet and our bet is that the digital experience will play a lot more like a video game. All right. Hopefully it's like GoldenEye because I'm pretty decent <laughs> at that. <laughs> but, but, but then, but then everything, everything is green boxes and ramps. That's true. You know, I, I do think though one um, I, I'll, I'll add to that. Uh, I think some evidence to support your uh, um, assessment there is Google analytics four in that um, Google is not treating app or website analytics any differently anymore. And they're really working and they have been, Google's been working hard at, you know, cross platform, cross device, even in-person digital analytics of measurements, more so on like event based triggers than session based triggers because sessions themselves aren't necessarily the most helpful or productive um, measurement. So I, I do think that there's some evidence there. And I think if Google is moving in that direction, then uh, that they see a little bit less of a dividing line between apps and website and uh, even device use, just, there's just probably some truth to that. All right, Austin, we're going to jump to the last three here questions that are more about you. So listeners get to know you just a bit better. First one, what are you reading? Ooh, um, I'm actually rereading a book. Um, that counts. Leadership is language. Uh, hey, all right. I, I think communication is vital uh, when running an organization. Um, how you say things um, does matter a lot. Um, mm -hmm. And when it comes to a partially remote team like we are, um, the chances for communication are even fewer. Mm -hmm. So the magnitude or the importance of each one uh, is greater. So it's one of my books on my like reread every year list. Um, I have like three or four of them. Um, oh, very cool. And that's what I'm currently reread. Awesome. Number two, who are you learning from? I gotta say, and, and, and he'll he'll love that I say this. Um, our CTO, uh, James, um, joined us about a year ago. Um, has spent many years at Amazon, other startups. Like has led teams of over a hundred people. Um, like this is my first time managing people. <laughs> So I am I am learning an absolute ton from from him in terms of what it means to to be an effective manager. Um, and mm. um, yeah, I, I I I feel like I learn from him every day. Very cool. All right, last one here. What inspires you? So. It's kind of my default answer uh, that I go to, but um, at the end of high school, um, I 
remember thinking, oh man, like I'm going to go off to college. I have no idea like what real life is going to look like. Um, and I write a lot. Um, I, I, I journal actually still probably almost every day. Um, and at the end of my high school journal, um, uh, I just wrote, all I want to do is to live an interesting life. So very cool. I'm always, I, I think for me, like I, I enjoy building things. I enjoy pursuing novel experiences. I, I enjoy mm -hmm. doing things and, and getting good at them. Um, uh, but ultimately, um, it's, it's not about an end point. It's, it's about an interesting journey. I can dig it. Austin, uh, thank you so much for coming on the show. I really appreciate and, uh, and greatly enjoyed the, the discussion here. Um, setting me straight on how peak is beyond just a point solution. Uh, but also like where you guys are, are, are headed moving forward. Congrats on the upcoming product launch. Uh, and really, I think, um, sharing some solid insights on AI, what it means, what it can be and how it's more than just listing descriptions. Thank you for not saying that. Um, <laughs> but before we close out for those who want to get connected to you or learn more about peak, where do they go and how do they do that? Our website, www.peekpeek.us. Uh, you can email me directly, austin, A-U-S-T-I-N, at peak.us. Very cool. And then uh, hopefully we'll see you around. Uh, if I get to New York, we'll go for a run. All right. Sounds good. All right. We'll see you. Thanks, Nate. Thanks for listening to TechNest, the PropTech podcast. Find all the links and resources mentioned in this episode on technest.io. You can get future episodes delivered to your ears directly by subscribing to the podcast on iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and all other major podcast apps. Follow TechNest on social media to stay up to speed on new developments, resources, and announcements in PropTech. Your support is greatly appreciated. There's two ways you can directly support this podcast. Share episodes you find interesting and then leave a review of the show in the App Store. From Nate and the TechNest team, thanks for listening.